it's the word of God where we're going. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 13. And uh, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, I praise you. You're so good to me. You know the Lord is good. The Lord gave me a word a few days ago. I don't know that I'll be sharing that anything about that tonight. I know that's not the thrust. I don't know if I'll even mention it tonight, but I'm telling you the truth. Uh, now, it wasn't, you know how people can fall under the power. Well, it wasn't me falling under the power, but what he said to me was so staggering, I kind of fell up against the door. I said, my God, what? I, I never I never saw that. I, I, never, I never saw that. So uh, when I say the Lord is good, I'm not just saying that as a little slogan, brothers and sisters, the Lord is good to me. I don't know about the rest of you, but the Lord is good to me. Hallelujah. God is good to me. He's brought me through. So, I mean, just look at this. We were told that everything's going to just be blown over. Isn't that right? I mean, you saw the forecast. Stop everything. And, and look at us. The Lord has been good to us. I was talking to him this morning about this situation, and, but, but I, I won't go into it. I know many of you pray. I, I, know, I heard Deacon pray the, last night. I know many of you were praying, but uh, uh, he did it again. I, I will tell you this. I, I, I told the Lord this morning. I told him this morning. I was driving in Florence over near the mall, and it just so happened I looked toward the, the Florence Center, and I said to the Lord, Lord, I remember when we were having that conference a few years ago, and they said it was going to storm, and it was going to do all kinds of things. I remember being at the, at the service station, and you know, when you start the gas, they start giving you all kind of extra information that you didn't ask for, and uh, it looked almost like a slot machine. It was rolling up what the weather's going to be like. Fling! Storm! Fling! Storm! That, that's all it was. And uh, God held back all of the rain until the end of the Saturday session. After the Saturday session, it began to rain. And I told the Lord, I said, you, you did it before, you know. Really, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty much what I told him. But I didn't do a lot of praying about this event. I, I, I did talk to him this morning, but I, I didn't do it because I just believe, I, I just believe that, uh, you know, he who hath begun this good work in you, he's going to perform it to the day of Christ. He's going to bring it all the way through. Amen. I'm not telling you that I don't believe the weatherman. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, that God's work, when he has decreed it, it's going to come through. Uh, let, let's go to Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs. We're going to Matthew. Let's go to Proverbs. And I'm going to try to cut this short. I, I thank God for what we have, but I want to cut this short. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 16. The book of Proverbs chapter four, uh, 18 and verse 16. It reads as follows. A man's gift, a man's gift, maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Then the book of, of Matthew chapter 13. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, chapter 13 and verse 33, please. Thank you, Lord. All right, verse 33 reads as follows. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a man took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Amen. All right. We want to call this, let's read that again. Let's read that again, media. Put that back up. That's good. Let's read it again. 
It's a whole parable in one verse. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven, which is interchangeable for kingdom of God, is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Amen. All right. The title of the lesson, Influence. That's our, our theme is influence. The, the, the theme, can you put the flyer back up, um, sister? This is the last time I asked for it until the end. Uh, neglect not the gift, influence, okay? The title of the lesson is Influence, colon, why he put you there. Why he put you there. Influence, why he, that is why God put you there. Amen. Would you repeat that? And those of you that are in the uh, uh, hopping uh, platform, would you put it in the chat? Somebody let me know if it goes in the chat. I'd like to know it since I can't see what's happening in hopping. Uh, uh, everybody say who's in the room, say influence. influence. Colon, why he put you there. Why he put you there. Amen, amen. All right. My, my, my dear friends, my dear brothers, and my dear sisters, this is Kingdom of the Arts and Media Festival. And one of the key things that we emphasize in this meeting is that we emphasize uh, the original intention of God. And an, a synonym for original intention of God is kingdom of God, or gospel of the kingdom of God. And as always, in order to ascertain God's original intention, we have to go back to where all things human originate, and they originate in God. And the, the record of the origination is found, Old Covenant, Genesis chapter 1, New Covenant, John chapter 1, and the corresponding places in the epistles. We read in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That's absolutely powerful, isn't it? And yet, when we get to John chapter 1, John chapter 1 uh, takes us back beyond Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Because John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was, or in the beginning existed, in the beginning in the Greek was existing the Word. And the Word was existing or coexisted with God, and the Word was God. And, and was, of course, is just the past tense of the infinitive to be from which we get words like is and all the other being terms. And so you could just as readily say in the beginning is the word. Why? Because God is eternal. God is the I am. In the beginning, by the time the beginning began, the word already is. The word, uh, the word said this, remarked this in the 8th chapter of John one day. The word said this, before Abraham was, I am. And so, so the word is eternal. The word is timeless. The word transcends time. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, existed with God, and the word existed God. The same existed in the beginning with God. Verse 3. Now, Genesis 1 and 1 catches up to John 1 and 3. Are you hearing me? So my dear brothers, my dear sisters, New Testament Genesis actually takes us farther back than Old Testament Genesis. No wonder the Bible calls it a better covenant. All right. And the Bible says that uh, all things were made by him. That's Genesis 1 and 1. So when the Bible said in the beginning God created the heaven and earth, you could read it in the beginning Jesus. Because the Bible tells us the word 1 and 3 that made all things in verse 14 of John 1 was made flesh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Verse 3 says all things were made by him. And then him who made all things was made. 
No, I'm talking about verse 14. God is saying the word was made flesh. All things were made by him and then he turned around and was made. The creator became a creature. My dear brothers and sisters, the original intention of God then for mankind is laid out for us in verse 26 of Genesis 1 where it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have, don't, stay with me please, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. So what is God doing? He's making man, he says. But verse 27 says, so God created man uh, in his own image. And the image of God created him male and female created he them. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful. So what's he doing? He's, he's making them. See, see, the purpose of God for mankind is for mankind to know him and to make him known. I mean, that's the essence of it. To know God and to make him known. God wanted fellowship and then God wanted a partnership. He wanted fellowship in the sense of a family. But then he wanted partnership. He wanted that family to become a greater and greater and greater a partaker of and a enjoyer of, shall we say, uh, of his goodness. And, and then to reflect that to the rest of his creation. Now, now, again, Genesis 1, Old Testament Genesis, John 1, New Testament Genesis. How many know that by the time we get to Genesis, Old Testament chapter 3, man falls away from God's original intention? Isn't that right? Now, he said this. Let, let, me, let me go back before I go forward. He said, I want to make man in my image after my likeness. Now, the image of God is Christ. The Bible tells us, Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4 and 5, he says that uh, Christ, who is the image of God, uh, Hebrews 1 and 3, says that he's the image of God. So that when, when the Bible says that God made man in his image, the first and most important thing it means is that he made man in Christ. He made him in Christ. All right. But then he also says, after my likeness, that means resembling God. In my image, representing God in the Greek, or Hebrew rather, uh, 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 after my likeness, resembling God. And what's beautiful, what's beautiful for every one of you that are streaming or that are listening or however you're connected, uh, you resemble God even on your worst day. The enemy doesn't want you to know it. And, and, and then what the enemy will do, since he, he knows that if he comes straight up and lies to you, looking ugly as he is, you'll probably rebuke him if you don't run. So what he'll do is he'll cloak it in religion and he'll say, you know, don't say that now because you got to be humble. Don't say that you resemble God, you know, because that's sacrilegious. That's, oh, you're making yourself too high. Too late. God did it. God is the one who said, in my image after my likeness. Are you listening to what I'm saying? And so, Despite your faults and flaws and foibles and failures, you resemble God. You resemble God. And even though man fell, he was originally able to represent God and he resembled God. When he fell, he lost the character necessary to represent God. But he still re retained measures of the capacity of resembling God. And that's why the enemy hates you so much. It's just like these ghetto kings and ghetto queens who beat the baby because they mad with the daddy or the mama. You understand what I'm saying? And they can't get the daddy, they can't get the mama, so they beat the child or they abuse the child. Are you listening to what I'm saying? That's, that's what happened with the devil. The devil knows that he cannot defeat God. He knows that he can't challenge God. But because you are so deeply loved by God that he knows that if he can hurt you, that in effect hurts God. Say it this way. The Lord's been dealing with me recently with this phrase. The enemy knows that the only way that he can defy, are you familiar with the word D-E-F-Y, defy? The only way that Satan can and defy God is by defiling humans. That's his intent. He defiles human beings in order to defy God. You see it? 
because God said in my image after my likeness and, 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 and uh, he's a ghetto king and he wants to uh, hate on what God loves because you look so much like your old daddy. You've heard it in the hood. Look so much like your case. You understand what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Hallelujah. You resemble God. Tell somebody near you on your worst day. You look like God to the devil. You might not look like God to your neighbors. You might not look like God to your family. But that enemy, because he's a spirit, he can look past your weaknesses. He can look past your struggles. And he knows that if God ever puts his hand on you, you're going to begin to live out what you look like. Hey, I feel you, Lord. I don't want to preach this yet. Hey, God, God, God. All right, then. All right, let's see if we can move a little further. My dear brothers, my dear sisters, the original intention is that you represent God and that you resemble God. We fell from it in chapter 3. But look, John chapter 1. I told you New Testament Genesis precedes Old Testament Genesis. Uh, and, and, and not only does it precede, but it supersedes. Here it is, verse 10. He was in the world. And the world was made by him, John 1. And the world knew him not. Verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Well, look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to get back what they lost. Come on now. Hallelujah. To them gave he power. Hallelujah. What they forfeited in Genesis Old Testament, they are able to regain in Genesis uh, New Testament. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. But I want to tell you beyond that, that even in the fallen state, Lord, I wish I could, could really go through this, even in the fallen state of man, the Bible says in uh, the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, God has placed in every human being capacity, placed in every human being aptitude, placed in every human being certain skills, certain proclivities, certain curiosities and inquisitivenesses. God has placed those things in every human being. The scripture says the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. All human beings belong to God. Not just those who speak with other tongues. Not just those who prophesy. Not just those who have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. But even those who are cursing his name. Even those that are agnostic. Those who are skeptics. Those who are atheists. They still belong to God and everything they have comes from God. That's what this meeting is about. That's what this word is about. That's what kingdom of God message is about. You need to come to him because he's already come to you. You need to come after him because he's already come after you. You really need to get to know him because he is not madly in love, but wisely in love. Sanely in love. Hallelujah with you. And he did not take his goodness from me or from you because we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity. You're still a genius. You're still an athlete. You're still a scientist. You're still an educator. You've still got the ability to organize. You've still got the ability to plan and to dream and to strategize. God made you that way. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And when we talk about kingdom of the arts and media, we mean that all of the giftings, the artistic gifts, the gifts in the media and all the rest, all the things that manifest themselves as occupations and disciplines and career clusters and professions, all those things are manifestations of God's original intention for mankind. And when he gives us salvation, the primary reason that he gives us salvation is that, again, that we might know him. But what's the second reason? That we might make him known. We're back to knowing him, and now we're to make him known. And with these gifts, with these capacities, with these properties and skills that you have, God intends to use you and to partner with you in order that you might heighten those gifts that you might express those abilities and in doing so make him known 
It's over in the book of Matthew. I believe it's, uh, in fact, I know it's chapter 5. I believe it's verse 16. But he says, let your light so shine, verse 16, uh, before men that they may do what? See your good works. See, the gift that you have, the gift that you have is the ability to do a work. It's the ability to accomplish some uh, goal. It is the ability to make a difference. It is the ability to make an impact. And the Bible says that as you do this, men will see it and glorify your Father which is in heaven. May I say one more thing about this before we go now into the lesson proper. And that is the Bible says, let your light so shine that men may see. Now many times in, in our religious zeal, in our zeal to be humble, we don't realize uh, that there is a humility which means submission unto God. It means a lowliness of attitude toward oneself so sober attitude toward oneself but many times religion comes and exaggerates that and tells you uh, you should not be seen. You, you should not do what you do with an eye to being seen. It shouldn't matter to you whether you are seen or not. And it shouldn't matter to you how you are seen. But my dear brothers and my dear sisters, this text here says, let your light so shine before men that they may see. So when we're dealing with things like marketing, when we're dealing with things like branding, when we're dealing with things like image management, those things are not unspiritual unless you are unspiritual. No, you need to manage your image. It should matter to you what you look like and what people think of you and what your presence in social media looks like. Those of you that are forever taking a picture of yourself with, with, with oh God help me now. Uh, taking these photos of you in less than flattering postures don't you know that once you put those things into the digital media there's no guarantee that you can ever uh, reclaim that thing or, 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 or cause that thing to disappear don't you understand that as you're growing in your profession don't you understand that as you're attempting to build your resume you don't need to become your own worst enemy by putting certain images and certain rhetoric out in your name don't you understand you don't have to comment on every situation that takes place you don't have to put your two cents worth if you don't have a two cents you know you need to keep that you don't have to put your two cents worth in everybody's business you don't have to get on their schedule and you know what I'm concerned about sanctified people but I'm concerned about professional people even if you are not sanctified it seems to me you ought to be sensible enough not to have all your thighs out sister I don't mean a bit of harm but I think that you ought to uh, excuse me excuse me excuse me you know if, if, if you're not holy enough to do it how about just be professional enough are you understanding what I'm saying you do understand that your prospective uh, employer or your uh, perspective funder that individual who is going to help you get started with that entrepreneurship somebody's got to give you a grant somebody's got to give you a low interest loan somebody's going to need to give you a hand what kind of image are you building he said let your light so shine before men that they may see your thighs no that they may see other parts of your anatomy that they shouldn't see unless they got a ring for you no he said let them see your good work problem with some of you is that you don't have any work. All you got going for you is thighs. But let me tell you something my dear brother or my dear sister or your hairy chest or whatever you got brother. But ladies and gentlemen let me tell you, you this. The individual that you really want to attract with that stuff ladies and gentlemen that individual is lower than where you're supposed to be trying to go. In other words if he did oh God come on back come on back come on back how does this fit? It fits because we're talking about kingdom of the arts and media. Listen, media is, is, is perhaps, media is perhaps the most powerful molder of culture, at least in the public arena. I know we've got the family and I know we've got the church, but in a real sense, the media is dominating almost all of the other aspects of culture in terms of shaping culture. You follow what I'm saying? And so I'm saying to you, I'm, I'm still in the scripture. He said, let your light so shine. 
before men that they may see your good works. Let that man, sister, let that woman, brother, or whatever, or whoever you're trying to draw the attention of, let that person be captivated by who you are, not just what you got. Because what you got is going to wrinkle one day. What you got is going to crinkle one day. What you got is going to sag, unless you die first. It's going to sag one day. But what you are and who you are will never diminish. It'll continue to increase. All right. It uh, feels kind of like Sunday morning. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You probably didn't come for that. But, but, but he, said, he said, manage your image. He did. He did. Jesus said, in the book of Matthew, same Matthew, uh, chapter 16, the Bible says that when they came uh, into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am, that I, the Son of Man, am? And the Bible says, some say that you are, and some say that you are, and some say that you are. And then he says, and whom say ye that I am? In other words, he's managing image. He's he, he's, he's careful about branding. He's so careful about branding that when he healed certain people, he told them, don't tell anybody. Everybody's not supposed to know all your business. Every, listen to me. Everybody's not supposed to know everything that's going on with you. And, 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 and listen, if you plan to open your business in November, people should not be in July already digging around in your stuff. In other words, you might do something for a new client or a prospective client for a, you know, he needs it and it's urgent, so you're going to do it now. But I'm not really opening to the public until November. You manage it. If you don't manage it, it's going to manage you. You follow that? Hallelujah. Well, yeah. let's move forward. So, so now, that gift that he's placed within you, what was that gift placed within you for? To be a part of that making him known. Know him. And then make him known. Now that those of you who are born again are born again, I want to tell you that 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 he's put in you, if it's a natural gift, he wants to supernaturally infuse it. If it's a supernatural gift, he wants to mature you in the full manifestation of the gifting. You've read Romans 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You've read Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at, uh, really, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Uh, you've read Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 11. And you've read 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. All of these are catalogs, relatively speaking, of giftings, supernatural giftings that God places in the lives of his people. Uh, and then they are natural. I don't have to tell you about your natural gifting. You can write. You can draw. Uh, you read well. Um, you, you reason well. You, you're strong in mathematics. You're strong in science. You're strong in uh, history. Uh, you're strong in these various areas. All of these are natural gifts. You're athletic. You, you can act. Uh, you, 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 you can sing. All of those are natural gifts. But whether it is a natural gift or whether it is a uh, spiritual gift, God wants to supernaturally infuse that gift for his glory. Can you say amen? Now, let's look at uh, Proverbs 18, 16. The Bible says, A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Notice now that uh, the Bible does not say God's gift. It says a man's gift maketh room for him. And uh, many times this verse has been misquoted. Misquoted. The first time I heard it, it was a misquote. And here it went. Your gift will make room for you. That's how I heard it quoted. Your gift will make room for you. And here's what they meant when they said it. They said that if God has given you anything, if you have a talent, if you have a skill, what have you, in the fullness of time, it's going to come to a place of prominence. It's going to come to a place of recognition. It's going to come to a place of profitability. It's going to come to a place of benefit. That's what they said. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is not what this text is teaching us because what they're describing is God's gift. The fact that you can sing is God's gift. The fact that you can play ball, that's God's gift. The fact that you play the instruments, that's God's gift. The fact that you uh, can write uh, programs for uh, computer systems, that's God's gift. The fact that you can organize uh, systems and organize events, all of that is God's gift to you. But the Bible didn't say God's gift makes room for you. 
All right? And let me prove it to you very quickly. How many of you have known people who could sing better than almost anybody who is in the public right now? Uh, you, you've known people who could uh, dance, people who were athletes and so forth. They, they had gifts that were much stronger than many of the people that we see in the public sector. Many of the ones that are considered to be stars and celebrities. How many of you have known people who could out sing or, or out do whatever it was? I have. I, I, I've known, I'm thinking about one lady right now. That lady could out sing virtually traditional gospel. She could out sing virtually any traditional gospel singer you can name. And the one she couldn't out sing, she could equal. I'm telling you the truth. That lady could say, she never made an audio cassette or an eight track. She never made a vinyl album. She certainly didn't make CDs or DVD. She died unknown, except in the local area. Died unknown. If the, if the way they quote that scripture, your gift will make room for you, why wasn't she nationally known? Why didn't she get a, a, a record deal? It is because the Bible never said, uh, God's gift will make room for you. It says, a man's gift now, how do you go from God's gift to a man's gift? You take what God gave you and give it. You take what God gave you and apply it. When you take what God has given you and apply it to some system, you take what God has given you and apply it to somebody's life. It is no longer God's gift now. It is God's gift, but it's not just God's gift. Now it's your gift. It is a man or woman's gift. And the Bible says that when you give of what God has deposited in your life, it makes room for you. Did you hear me? God's gift makes room for God, but your gift makes room for you. A man's gift maketh room for him, is what the text says, and brings him before great men. Now, have you ever studied that part? I know you studied a man's gift makes room for him, but have you studied that part about and bringeth him before great men? Stay with this. What the scripture is saying is that not only will the gift open a door, not only will the gift provide when you give that gift, not only will to provide opportunity but it's going to bring you into proximity it's going to bring you into a position everybody say position God wants to use what he placed in you to position you oh church I said God uh, brother Brown God brother Blanding God uh, brother, brother Hunter God wants to position you by means of what he placed in you are you hearing what I'm saying? God has made a deposit in you, but that deposit is taking you somewhere. Glory to God, brother Gabe. Somebody under the sound of my voice ought to say what God put in me is designed to be my passport. What God has put in me is designed to place me. It's designed to position me. It's designed to locate me. It's designed to station me in a given area. The Bible says a man gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. What are great men? What's the Bible mean when it says great men? It means men. It means men or women who are men or women of means. It means they are men or women of power. It means they are men or women of wealth. It means they are men or women of notoriety and fame. And the Bible says that when you take what God has given you and you begin to apply it, God says the giving of what I gave you is going to position you. And it's going to bring you into proximity with people who have more than you have. Oh God, they're going to bring they're going to bring you these gifts, these abilities are going to bring you before people who can do some things that you can't do. Ah, they're going to bring you before some people who can provide some opportunities that you can't provide, who can pay some tuition and fund some scholarships uh, that you're not able to the Bible says a man's gift uh, maketh room for him uh, and bringeth him before great men. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, what are great men? I told you that they are men of uh, means, men and women of means. They're men and women of wealth. They're men and women of uh, prestige. Uh, they're men and women of fame. Uh, and let's say it another way. They are men and women of uh, influence. Uh, God says uh, that I'm going to bring you close uh, to those who have influence. Uh, I'm going to bring you close uh, to those who are making decisions that affect whole demographics. Uh, he said, I'm going to bring you close uh, to those who are deciding what happens in your community. I'm going to 
to bring you close uh, to those who decide what happens in your city those that decide what happens in your classrooms in your building what happens in your district what's going to happen in the medical community what's going to happen in dialysis of the community thereof God says I'm going to use what I gave you when you gave it when you sow it when you invest it when you apply it into the lives of others I'm going to use that thing to position you would you tell somebody near you God has put something in you God has put some ability in you God has put some property in you God has put some capacity in you and by means of what he put in you when you apply that thing that thing is going to position you the application of that thing is going to give you proximity to those who have more than you have those who know more than you know those who've seen more than you've seen those who can do more than you thus far have done are you listening to me I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. And I told you that the title of the lesson is Influence. Uh, why he put you there. Uh, a man's gift uh, maketh room for him uh, and puts him uh, there. You see it? Puts him in a place. You know, there's a place in Proverbs where it said, if you see a man that's diligent in his business, the Bible says that he shall stand before kings. He will not stand before mean men. Hallelujah. That is ordinary people. God wants to do something. I know somebody you having to fight a religious demon that says that that's pride and that's arrogance. It's not pride. It's not arrogance. God doesn't just need somebody position to minister to the down and out. God needs somebody position to minister to the up and out as well. Ladies and gentlemen, there are homeless people who need Jesus but there are also billionaires who need Jesus. Hell does not discriminate Hell does not discriminate. Hell doesn't mind the fact that you come through Hollywood. Hell doesn't mind the fact that you came from Wall Street. Hell does not mind that you came from Capitol Hill or the White House or the Supreme. Hell doesn't mind that you came from the pulpit. Hell doesn't mind. Hell doesn't discriminate. So God, God, God will use what he placed in you to position you. Hallelujah. Are you aware of being positioned? Is there anybody on the No, no, no. Y'all think I'm just a preacher. I'm trying to talk to you by the Spirit. I'm going to ask you again. Are you aware that you're being positioned? Can you see God ordering your steps? Actually, already having ordered your steps, but now ordering you to follow his ordered steps? Hmm. Really? No, no, no. Don't lie to me. And don't just, don't, 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 don't patronize me. If it's not so, just keep looking in one straight direction. But can you sense down inside you and even certain aspects of your life, uh, can you sense God ordering, God uh, positioning, God aligning, God strategizing huh, to get you where you need to be? I'll tell you what to do. Look back. Huh? Look back at your life over the past five years, huh? over the past 10 years. And look at the path. Huh? Look at the circuitous route. Huh? Lord, I praise you now. Huh? Look at the painstaking detail huh? that God applied huh? in getting you to where you are right now. Huh? Somebody said, well, huh? I don't have a whole lot of money. Well, don't look at the money only. Huh? But look at who you are on the inside. Look at the wisdom that you've grown. Come on, church. Huh? Look at the relationships that God has allowed you to tap into. Huh? Look at the experiences. Huh? Look at the exposure that you've had in your life. Please don't worry about the money. When God gets you where he needs you to be, the money's waiting on you. Are you... All right. Okay. All right. Don't be 
be hung up in materialism. The world is bigger. Hallelujah. God says he'll bring you in position with those who have influence. I'm talking about though uh, why, that's what we're trying to get to, why he puts you there. Now, uh, I don't have it a very few minutes. There is, there is a term that I'd like to lift up. Let's use this as one of our vocabulary terms for tonight. It is the term lobbyist. Everybody say lobbyist. L-O-B-B-Y-I-S-T. Everybody say lobbyist. Uh, now, a lobbyist uh, is an individual uh, who goes in and out of the halls of power. In other words, you'll find lobbyists uh, at the state house. You'll You'll find lobbyists uh, at the state capitol. You'll find lobbyists uh, at Capitol Hill. You'll find lobbyists wherever there are people who are decision makers for uh, 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 a, a nation or decision makers for a state or the, the decision makers for uh, a municipality. You'll find lobbyists. Uh, and the, the simple dictionary definitions uh, read as follows. A lobbyist is one who conducts activities. Uh, listen to the definition and see if anything sounds familiar. A lobbyist is one who conducts activities aimed at influencing or swaying public officials. All right? Here's another. Uh, lobbyists are professional advocates that work to influence political decisions. Next definition. A, 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 a lobbyist uh, uh, is uh, uh, one, someone who earns a certain amount of money uh, over three months uh, from lobbying activities. What are those activities? Influencing uh, those who are the decision makers. Are you listening to me? And so lobbying is uh, what happens when an individual is in position to influence the influencer. You didn't hear me. Yeah, you probably did. I said, oh God, I said that a lobbyist is an individual who is positioned uh, to influence influencers. Most of the time, the lobbyist does not come on his own accord. Most time, the lobbyist is coming on behalf of some company, on behalf of some corporation, on behalf of some business. Listen, on behalf of some special interest. And so the lobbyist uh, goes to Congress and uh, offers the congressman certain, certain benefits uh -huh. provides opportunities for the congressman or the congresswoman to be wine and to be dined and to be treated well. But the reason why they're doing this is not just for the benefit of the congressperson, but the lobbyist is there to influence the decision making. Uh -huh. They know that there's a bill that's pending. Uh -huh. They know there's a bill that's hanging up in the Senate. They need a few more votes. Uh, come on here. Uh, there's a bill uh -huh, that's sitting on Capitol Hill uh, waiting for uh, uh, the House of Representatives uh, to vote. Uh, and so the lobbyist realizes uh, that if we don't have 10 representatives committed to this bill, uh, it's going to flop before it ever makes its way out to the Senate. Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, and so the lobbyist begins to come and wield influence on to the life of the influencer. And they are positioned to do so. There are many, if you go to Washington, uh, D.C. and other capitals uh, uh, and not only that but state capitals as well uh, you will find that virtually every special interest group uh, has an office somewhere in Washington or thereabouts uh, has a representative uh, in Columbia at the state house uh, whatever the state house is of your state uh, there are lobbyists that surround your senators uh, surround your representatives uh, can't wait to have dinner with them uh, can't wait to take them a ride huh, on their yacht. Huh? Can't wait to try to do something huh? uh, to touch their minds, huh? touch their hearts, huh? and somehow influence them. Everybody say influence. Well, I need you to understand, my dear brothers uh, and my dear sisters, uh, that even though lobbyists uh, and lobbying uh, can come across as having a negative connotation, uh, there is positive, uh, 
positive lobbying. Thank you, sir. Because you see, these men and these women don't know everything about everything. And so they need specialists. They need individuals that can come and give them insight as to the implications of their decisions. In other words, it might look like it's a simple vote. But because you're from the hood, you know that if you make that law, it's going to affect our babies in the ghetto. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If that law is made, it's going to systematize levels of racism. It's going to systematize certain levels of gender discrimination. And so I need for you to look at this law differently. I need you to make a different decision because I represent the unrepresented. And I'm speaking for those who have no voice. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm talking about why the lobbyist is there. And what I want to give the rest of my time to this evening is to talk to you about the kingdom lobbyist. Would everybody say the kingdom lobbyist? Oh, Lord, I praise your name. The kingdom lobbyist, that is that man or that woman that has understood that God has gifted him or her and has anointed him or her to influence influencers. Let's walk through the scripture quickly. Notice Joseph. Joseph, my dear brothers and sisters, God saw to it that Joseph ended up in Egypt. Egypt was the great power uh, of its day and God saw to it uh, that Joseph uh, would make his way down to Egypt Uh, he went as a prospective slave uh, sold by his brothers to his cousins Uh, but when he got to Egypt uh, thank you sir uh, he was sold as a slave and ended up you know uh, in Potiphar's house and from Potiphar's house uh, uh, to the prison he ended up uh, but ladies and gentlemen him and before it was over he went from uh, the prison to the palace it was a 17 year process how long are you willing to wait uh, it was a 17, uh, 13, excuse me, huh? a 13 year process. Huh? He was 17 when he was sold into slavery. Huh? And he was 30 when he became the prime minister huh? of Egypt. Huh? How long are you willing to wait? Huh? 13 is the number of the curse, huh? but it is the number of the broken curse. Huh? It is the number of redemption. Huh? One of the numbers of redemption. Hey, Lord, I praise your holy name. So my dear brothers Etaya and my dear sisters, Joseph was there 13 years and he didn't know it. But the reason why he was sold to Potiphar is because Potiphar was the chief of the prison guard. The king's prison guard. In other words, Potiphar was royalty. He was a part of the royal court uh, and uh, in Potiphar's house uh, uh, Joseph was able to pick up uh, on royal protocol. Uh, He was able to pick up on the culture of Egypt. Uh, You can be anointed but you still got to know the culture. Uh, You can be anointed but you still got to know the environment. Uh, Every company has a culture. Uh, Every organization has a culture Uh, and if you're going to rise in that system uh, you're going to have to learn to respect that culture Uh and then God will make it possible for you if necessary to shift and if necessary shape Uh or even shake that culture tell somebody from six feet or more away unless it's somebody who lives in your house tell them God will position you Uh, in order that you might learn the culture uh, of what you're going to conquer. uh, Say yes, Lord. Uh And when I say conquer, uh, I don't mean beat anybody up. Uh, I just mean God intends for you to rise. Uh, Look at somebody and say, rise. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, And so Joseph uh, learned, learned, learned uh, about the protocols of the palace uh, because 
because he learned it in Potiphar's house. And when he went to the prison, he already knew how one should matriculate in the palace. But not only that, God allowed him to associate with the butler and the baker. Who's butler and who's baker? Pharaoh's butler and Pharaoh's baker. Before they'd gone to prison, they had been influential. Potiphar was influential. Pharaoh's butler was influential. Pharaoh's baker was influential. Hallelujah. Uh, and that's where Joseph landed. Uh, you know what the Bible says that both of them had dreams. Uh, Joseph used uh, what God had given him. Uh, uh -huh, what is it? Uh, it's God's gift to you. Uh, but it doesn't become your gift until you give it. Uh, he had given his gift of administration uh, to Potiphar. Uh, now he gave his gift uh, of interpretation uh, to the butler and the baker. Both of their dreams came true. The baker was killed and the butler was reinstated. But the Bible said for two years, the butler forgot Joseph. And I want you to understand in this life, the people that you help, some of them are going to forget you or act like it anyhow. In this life, people that you lift up, some of them are going to forget you. But ladies and gentlemen, be not deceived and be not dismayed because the God who let them have amnesia is the same God who's going to bring them back and they're going to go from amnesia to I need you are you hearing what I'm saying because the Bible tells us that Pharaoh had a dream and the butler said I can't tell you what you dreamed about I can't tell you what it means but uh, there is a man and, uh, hey, I you here. There is a man who can tell you about your dream and the interpretation. Church, I got to get out of here and I got to get you out of here. And the Bible tells us that the butler, when he informed Pharaoh, Pharaoh sent for Joseph. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand that the reason why Joseph ended up in prison rubbing up beside the butler because God needed the butler to get him to Pharaoh all I'm trying to tell you is that wherever you are right now your job may feel like a prison your family may feel like a prison your industry may feel like a prison but believe it or not God has put you there for a ceiling and a reason he's getting you ready hey I'm not ready oh he's getting you ready can you say yes Lord the Bible tells us uh, that when Joseph uh, received the invitation, uh, or actually the demand, uh, the summons to stand uh, before Pharaoh, uh, the Bible said Joseph uh, shaved. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, see, he knew enough uh, about the protocol of Egypt uh, that the Egyptians uh, of higher caliber uh, made sure that they were clean shaven. Uh, and so Joseph said, even though uh, I'm an Israelite huh, on the inside. Huh, I'm going to look like an Egyptian today huh, on the outside. Huh, can you say yeah? Huh, in other words, I'm going to be culturally consistent. Huh, I'm going to be culturally appropriate. Huh, I'm going to be culturally relevant. Huh, can you say yeah, Lord? Huh, say yeah, Lord. Huh, hallelujah. Huh, notice how many times huh, that Joseph changed clothes. Huh, he had on his father's coat uh, of many colors uh, and they stripped him uh, and then he had on uh, uh, slave rags uh, and he, they stripped him uh, put him on steward clothes uh, and they stripped him uh, put him on an orange jumpsuit uh, are you hearing what I'm saying uh, but after the orange uh, jumpsuit uh, with the numbers on his back uh, yeah God uh, brought him out 
of the prison? Yes, he did. I brought him into Pharaoh's palace with more clothes on. And how many know that after he interpreted the dream, Pharaoh dressed him. Hallelujah. Tell somebody your change is not complete yet. You're about to undergo a wardrobe makeover. I wish I were preaching tonight. I said you're about to undergo a wardrobe makeover. Tell somebody there's about to be. Yeah. Somebody praise it, will you? Uh, there's about to be uh, a massive makeover. Tell somebody, massive makeover uh, is about to hit. You're not saying it. Uh, say it in faith. Uh, say it in hope. Uh, say it in love. Uh, tell somebody, a massive makeover uh, is about to hit your life. Uh, say it. Uh, uh, yeah, Lord, uh, Joseph uh, was put in the palace. Uh, he was put there uh, to be a lobbyist. Uh, I thought he was there, Brother Blue, uh, to be an interpreter. Uh, yes, he was. Uh, but what does a lobbyist do? Uh, a lobbyist speaks uh, to an influencer uh, on behalf uh, of a special interest group. Uh, who was it uh, that came uh, into the land of Egypt? Uh, it was Jacob. Jacob and his 70 family members, they came into Egypt. And when they got there, Joseph said, this is my father. These are my brothers. This is their family. And the Bible said that Pharaoh said, glad to meet y'all. Bow down to Jacob and say, I'm going to do this because of Joseph. I'm going to give you a land, your own land. And his name Goshen. Yes, I'm almost too happy to preach it. But he said, I'm going to give you your own land. And it's not because of who you are, but because Joseph means so much to this kingdom. I'm going to put you in the land of Goshen. Listen, Joseph had influence, but the question was, why did God put him there? What's the title of the lesson? Influence. Why God put you there? Joseph was put in Pharaoh's palace, and the reason why he was there is because Joseph had a brother. You've heard me tell it. His name is Judah, and Judah has a son, two sons, but one of the son's name is Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is going to beget a number of sons, Eshram, and Abinadab, and Nelson, all the way down to Boaz, to Obed, to Jesse, and to David, and David is going to have a great, great, great grandson named Jesus. Yeah! And so the reason why God put Joseph up next to Pharaoh is so that Jesus would have a safe landing coming to the earth. Somebody say, why? God put you there. Say yeah! Oh, hallelujah. I got to close it. But God put Moses in another Pharaoh's palace. Hallelujah. So that Pharaoh, that Moses could get the highest education. So that Moses could get the greatest exposure and the greatest experience. But why did God put Moses in Pharaoh's palace? Because Moses needed to be learned in all the ways of the ancient world because God knew that Moses was going to have to write six of the books of the canon. Hallelujah. Genesis through Deuteronomy and Job and some of the Psalms. Can you say yeah? And not only that, 
but Moses is going uh, to establish a nation. Uh, so in other words, uh, he didn't put Joseph uh, in Pharaoh's palace uh, just so uh, uh, Moses, uh, in this case, uh, in Pharaoh's palace, uh, just so he could be a big dog. Uh, but he put Moses there uh, because he needed uh, a lobbyist. Uh, what do you mean a lobbyist? Uh, don't you remember uh, that Moses uh, went to the influencer uh, named Pharaoh uh, and said, God said, uh, let my people go. Uh, how many know that was lobbying? Uh, hallelujah. Uh, Pharaoh didn't want to do it, uh, but God shook him up uh, through his kingdom lobbyists. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, he let the people go uh, because Moses uh, was a kingdom lobbyist. Uh, walk on over to the book of Esther. Aha, Esther has been made queen to Ahasuerus. She's cute. She got it going on. She got the best clothes. She got the best food. But why did God put her there? Because Haman wants to kill out all the Jewish people. And God wants to make sure that when Haman, I told you a few years ago in the kingdom of the arch, that when Haman would talk in the king left ear, Esther would talk in the king right ear. Can you say yeah? God gave Esther influence huh, so that her nation huh, would not be destroyed. Huh. She became huh, a kingdom lobbyist. Huh. The king huh, let the people go. Huh. The king huh, had Haman killed. Huh. And there's somebody huh, under the sound of my voice. Huh. The reason why huh, God put you huh, where he put you. Huh. The reason why you work huh, where you work. Huh. The reason why you live huh, where you live it's because God has ordained you to exercise influence that's why he put you there nobody else is praying that's why he put you there nobody else is holy that's why he put you there nobody else knows the word of God that's why he put you there stop trying to run away you trying to run out. God wants you to run in. Open your mouth and say, yeah, Lord. Oh, I got a close. I got a close. But Nehemiah was a kingdom lobbyist. Yeah. When the walls of Jerusalem had been torn down, Nehemiah went to the king and said, King, I got to do something about the condition of my city. Can you say yeah? And the king gave him all the resources. I want you to look at some near you and say in this next round of building God a house y'all tired I see tell them in this next round of building God a house in this next round of building of buildings for God in this next round of building clinics in this next round of building stores in this next round of building kingdom facilities we are not going to be relegated to selling chicken dinners. We're not going to be relegated to fish fries. Nothing wrong with fried fish. And nothing wrong with a good chicken dinner. But God is giving you influence. Somebody say, oh God. Uh, it's giving you influence. Uh, yeah. Uh, when Nehemiah uh, went to the king, uh, the king said, I got uh, all your lumber. Uh, I got uh, all your labor. Uh, what's going to happen uh, when the kingdom of God uh, needs to build a facility? Uh, and the influencers say, uh, I got all your lumber. Uh, and I got all your labor. Uh, I got your bricks. Uh, and I got an electrician. Uh, you better open up your mouth. Uh, Hallelujah. Influence. Hey, why God put you there? That's 
why you can't be a whole hopper because somebody's watching. You cannot be a liar. Somebody's watching. You can't be a hypocrite. Somebody's watching. God! Woo! feeling here. Say, oh God, hey, it's giving you influence. Hallelujah. People don't know it, but when your boss is having trouble, he'll wait till the ship in, and then he'll call you, and ask you, can you stay a little late? Ask you to come in the office and shut the door and begin to tell you private business, begin to tell you high-level business. That's not for you. Ha, to go tell anybody else ha, it's because God ha, has given you influence ha, that's why ha, he put you there ha, church say yes ha, church say yes Uh, hallelujah, uh, hallelujah, oh, Lord, I praise you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it wouldn't be right, uh, it wouldn't be a gospel sermon uh, if I didn't name uh, the greatest kingdom lobbyist uh, of them all, uh, his name, uh, hey, Lord, I feel you now, uh, I wish I could preach it the way I feel it, uh, uh, but his name, uh, you know his name, uh, his name is, uh, wait a minute, uh, before we go Go there, Matthew 1333 said that there is a substance called yeast that a woman took and hid it and pre-measured the flour. Yeast is a single cell fungus. That's all yeast is. It's a fungus with one cell. But when yeast is mixed with flour and conditions are made fair favorable. Hallelujah. The yeast begins to call the flower to do what it couldn't do on its own. I said it this way. The, the yeast makes the dough do. Can you say yeah? I said that the yeast causes the dough to do. Causes the dough to rise. Causes the dough to expand and fulfill its bread potential. The reason why God has put you in the system because he put you there to make that thing make that company make it rise make the dough do say yeah when you get in there everything is supposed to rise get your hand up and say when I show up on my job everything there is supposed to rise when I walk in my neighborhood, everything in there is supposed to rise. Church say, yeah. Uh, but notice, uh, give me about five minutes, uh, and I'm gonna give you up. Uh, notice, Masha. Uh, notice uh, that the parable said uh, that the yeast uh, was hidden. Uh, in other words, uh, if you had looked at the yeast uh, in the middle of the flower, uh, you wouldn't have been able to tell uh, that the yeast was even there. Uh, hallelujah! Uh, but you'll know it's there uh, when its impact is seen. Uh, you'll know it's there. When its effect is known. But in the meanwhile, the woman hid the yeast in the flower. And I want to talk to somebody that's wondering when your turn is coming. When your chance is coming. Where your platform is. Where your audience is. Just know this that if you let God, He'll hide you in a system. He'll hide you in an environment. But then he'll make conditions favorable for you to begin to do what you do. And make the don't do what it do. Do what it does. Can you say yeah? You're going to make some stuff rise. When it gets hot, you begin to stretch out. When it gets hot, you begin to have a chemical reaction. Church say yeah. Oh, the greatest uh, kingdom lobbyist uh, of them all uh, is the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, he was hidden uh, on the earth. Uh, nobody knew uh, that God uh, had 
invaded the earth. No one knew that the eternal had invaded time. Nobody knew that the invisible had been seen. Nobody knew that the intangible had taken on a form. Nobody knew, hey, I'm a shire, that the omnipotent, or rather the omnipresent, had become localized. The omnipotent had a limited power. Say yeah. And the omniscient had limited knowledge. But the Bible tells us the world knew him not. I quoted earlier. But what did the Bible say? God made conditions favorable for Jesus. And the water was made into wine. Favorable. That, you know what? Uh, hallelujah uh, how many know uh, that for water uh, to be made wine uh, or rather for grapes uh, to be made wine uh, grapes become wine uh, through fermentation uh, and fermentation uh, is the introduction uh, of yeast uh, wine is made uh, as a result of yeast uh, and what I'm trying to tell you uh, is that God uh, saw to it uh, that Jesus first miracle uh, was a yeast miracle. Can you say yeah? Yes! The hidden Christ was about to be revealed. Yes! The miracle worker was about to be revealed. Church say yeah. Tell somebody you might not believe it, but you're about to perform a yeast miracle by the power of God. Yes! The unrecognized is going to become the undeniable. The unrecognized it's going to become the undeniable church say yeah two minutes and the Bible said that when Jesus got on the cross Lord that's a long stretch but when Jesus was up on the cross he began to lobby y'all ain't saying he began to lobby what does a lobbyist do he goes to somebody that's got influence and begins to influence the influencer he went to the cross he didn't talk to Pilate much didn't talk to Herod at all. Didn't talk to Caiaphas much. Well, when he got on the cross, he began to lobby. He said, Father. Oh, he said, Father, hey, forgive them. But they know not hey, what they do. Now remember the lobbyists at Capitol Hill. They may offer money. They may offer food. They may offer a yacht ride. But Jesus offered his own life. He offered his spirit, soul, and body. Can you say yeah? He said sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body thou hast prepared me. Say yeah. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I want you to know, hey, hallelujah. The reason why he was lobbying is because there was a law that was against us. There was a law that had condemned us. There was a law that had sent us to hell. But when Jesus became our lobbyist, I heard the Bible say that the law of the spirit of life has made us free from the law of sin and death. Church say yes. Jesus is the kingdom lobbyist. Jesus is the influencer. He brings about change. I'm giving you up. He brings about change. Look at somebody and tell them I know he's my lobbyist. Tell them God should have destroyed me. But the lobbyist say give him another chance. Somebody praise him. I gotta quit. Somebody praise him. I'm done. Well, take about 30 seconds. Since they're playing the celebration, take about 30 seconds and praise them right there. Hey! Woo! I feel like 
feel a dance coming on. Look at somebody near you. Tell them all I'm trying to tell you. Y'all ain't saying it. Tell them say, all the preacher is trying to tell you is that you needed somebody to go to the king on your behalf. And it couldn't be just anybody. It had to be somebody who had influence. And the reason why God put you in that family is because your family needs somebody who can go to the king. Yeah, your company needs, your school needs somebody. God is trying to tell you is that the reason why he's given you stay right there the reason why he's given you the gifting and the talent the skill the degree the credential the favor that's influence all of that's influence he's done that because he needs for you to lobby for the kingdom in your position you are to be the incarnation of thy kingdom come in your classroom in your OR or ER in your judges chambers in your law office you are to be the enfleshment of God's intention thy will be done thy kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven. You and I are called adoration. You and I are called kingdom lobbyists. That's why he put you there. I feel the power of God. I really. I cannot lay my hands on you and I can't lay my hands on these. But I tell you, that anointing to impart, I sense it right now. Come on. Come on, can we all adore? I'm going to pray over you. And those of you that are having difficulty in the position where you labor, I'm going to ask God to keep you there for as long as it takes for you to accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish there and then either move you or move them. And he's just as capable of the one as he is the other. Come on, come on. Stay with me. I need you all to stay with me in adoration. I need you to stay with me in adoration. I need you to stay with me in adoration. Come on, keyboard. Come on. Come on. I need you. I need you. Thank you, sir. Somebody's on hopping. Hey, Tama. Somebody's on hopping. Somebody's, somebody's watching with somebody else. And you've been wondering about your positioning. I've come from God to tell you. There's a why he put you there. Yes. 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 Don't run. Don't run from it. Your steps are ordered. You run from sin, yes. You run from something that's endangering your body and, or, or your mind, certainly. But the natural cares of life come to all people. 
every profession has its level of stresses. Every career has its level of up and down. But you look at what God has been doing since you've been there. Look at the lives you've touched. Look at the people that you train who had a position higher than yours. But really and truly, they didn't know the job. They just had a credential you didn't have. But you trained them. Their pay grade is above yours, but you trained them. Don't you worry about it. Our God is God of justice. He knows how to recompense you for what you thought was overlooked. God hid you in the flower, but then God made conditions favorable that through you, the dough would do. Through you, a system that had bread potential but didn't have all the bread ingredients now becomes bread that's palatable that's luscious, not only nutritious, but delicious because your presence there has made the dough do. I pray with these men and women. I pray over these men and women. And I ask you, oh God, that you administer to them. That young man, that young woman who's just seeking for a sense of direction that one who thinks if I could just move somewhere. That one that's in the Northeast wanting to go across the country. And the one who's in the city that he or she wants to go to wants to leave there and go somewhere else. Help them to understand that it's not the place first. It's the person. And it's that person's alignment with God and his will in other words, the person discovering purpose. And the person discovering purpose will precipitate placement in the fullness of time. What you don't need, what you need is not a new place. What you need is clarity concerning purpose. For you are glorious and worthy to be praised the lamb upon the throne and unto you we lift our hearts in praise the lamb upon the throne. Father, minister to these people. I sense your anointing. I sense your anointing. I don't know who that is that's been so broken and so perturbed concerning purpose and placement. I can't put my hands on you, but he's putting his hand on you right now. This festival was designed for you. God is going to give you greater clarity and he's going to lift the burden that you've been carrying. I want you to get your expectation up. I command you to be made whole. I command things that have been out of alignment to come into alignment. And God is going to do certain supernatural works in your life just to confirm this word to you tonight. Hold it! I command the sick to be healed tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let yokes be destroyed and let burdens be removed because of the anointing. And Satan, I command you to loose that young man. Loose that young woman. Even that one that has contemplated suicide, I command you to loose him. Loose her in Jesus precious name. And all of you under the sound of my voice, those of you that are in this room, I'm not going to touch you, but I'm telling you God's anointing is here. If you can believe God, 
You know, sometimes the sin of familiarity can cause you to miss your miracle. But I'm telling you, there's an anointing here that God is releasing into your spirit. God, your creativity is going to flourish to another extent. Brown, your creativity, sir. The strategy for properly building the business it's multifaceted, but God's going to give you the framework as to how everything is to be properly plugged in so that it doesn't overwhelm you. Somebody say something right there. Come on. Brother Davis, put your hands on your stomach there. In Je both hands, I said hands. Hallelujah. You're impregnated with far more than what's obvious. I know that there's writing. We know that. We've We've talked about that, but there's far more in you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the strategy, the master strategy as to how those things are to be unfolded. Hallelujah. It's going to manifest. And I'll tell you something else. When you see something that looks like envy, I don't want you to become stressed. Hallelujah. It's, it's not really envy. It's just awe at how could one fellow have all of this insight? How could one fellow have all this knowledge? And all? He's not that old. How can he know what he knows? Put your hand over your... So do you believe what I'm telling you? Put your hands on your stomach, son. God is not going to let any of it be aborted. He's not going to allow any of it to miscarry, but he's going to bring you to full fruition. Somebody shout. Somebody shout something. Somebody shout something. Somebody shout something. Pastor, God has not forgotten you. God did not lie to you. And God is going to reward your faithfulness in the full. He's going to allow your name to drop some places. How much here? Some places where you've not been. You're going to wonder how did they know me or know of me? It's because God is going to position you for optimal demonstration and manifestation of his favor on your life. Everybody say something if you will. Those of you that are on this stream, I'm telling you, there is an anointing in this environment that even though I don't see you in the natural, God, God is moving on you, in you, and then moving you in the supernatural. Now, Father, if there's anyone who is not saved tonight, let him or her yield. Let him or her say, and you can say it after me if that's you. Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He's my lobbyist. I couldn't get to you for myself. But he's my lobbyist. He spoke for me. He had the influence to go to the throne carrying his own blood. John calls him the propitiation for our sins. Thank you. With my mouth, I confess, hey, Jesus is Lord. With my heart, I believe that God has raised him from the dead. He's cleansing me of my sins because I confess them all. I did it. I did it. I thought it. I said it. But he said he would cleanse me. So a new beginning has broken forth. A new beginning has broken forth. Thank you, Jesus. If that's you, if you pray with me, go to the DHCC Nation website, DHCC Nation, and look for the little tab that says what's next. And just go down in there and share with us what the Lord has done for you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. And we'll continue.